but he's nearly there. Oh, I'm right near the end. He nearly done it. One more. One more. Oh, <laughs> At home in Melbourne, it's rare for Josh Frydenberg to get time like this with his wife Amy and two young children, Blake and Gemma, especially so close to Budget Day. Coronavirus has cost Australia lives and livelihoods, so recalibrating the balance book is a continuing challenge for the Treasurer. For Josh Frydenberg, that challenge is clarified by a balance of work and family. Last year when you were in the, the midst of the crisis and we didn't know how bad it was going to be. Did you think about the kids much and Amy? Every day, um, they're the lens through which I look at life and I knew that they were doing it pretty tough through lockdown, just like every family indeed in Victoria was and so many other families around the country as our Defence Force personnel or our health professionals were working day and night to keep us all safe. But they got through it and Amy, my wife, has been a rock star. Hey, Blake. <laughs> OK, can I come into the car in a second? Yeah, and can I Yeah, sure. He's a good boy. <laughs> it's a timely reminder of what counts. Since opting for the Treasury portfolio in the aftermath of the 2018 Liberal leadership spill, Josh Frydenberg has faced three very contrasting situations for his first three budgets. Congratulations. The first... Back in black. Well, good day. I'm here with the treasurer, and he's delivering his first budget, and it's going to be a cracker. We are back in the black. How are you feeling, Josh? It's going to deliver the first surplus in more than a decade. I think that budget uh, uh, was confidence boosting, uh, and it confirmed the government, the Morrison government, as a safe pair of hands. A premature celebration cancelled by the coronavirus the once-in-a-century pandemic producing the largest deficit since World War II. This is a heavy burden, but a necessary one to responsibly deal with the greatest challenge of our time. 1.3 million Australians stood down temporarily or out of work permanently, their plight portrayed by long lines outside Centrelink. The historic economic blow required historic economic support. Extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures and this new $1,500 a fortnight job keep payment will provide job security at a time when it's needed most. The economic and personal cost of the COVID crisis was felt in Josh Frydenberg's home city of Melbourne more than anywhere else in the country. We're angry. I think uh, what Daniel Andrews has done is wrong. It's going to affect my livelihood. Lockdown's not the answer. He and his family among six million impacted by the state's deadly second wave and lengthy lockdowns. I am so happy to join with all those in this place in celebrating the fact that the numbers have come down. But don't pretend there hasn't been a price. And the price has been immense. And the cost couldn't have been higher for more than six million Victorians, Mr Speaker. You gave that speech, very critical of Daniel Andrews, and you copped a bit of flack for it from some quarters. Yeah. Others loved it. That seemed a really personal account to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that motion that was brought into the parliament surprised the Prime Minister and I. Um, it's pretty unusual to try to suspend standing orders at the start of question time as opposed to during question time. And uh, I sensed that they were trying to make a bit of politics out of what is a very difficult situation and I didn't hold back in putting the case forward as to, to why I, I, I felt the way I did uh, about recent events in Victoria and my thoughts were with all those people who were doing it tough um, and I spoke absolutely from the heart there and don't regret one word I said. There's little doubt his family were also front of mind, stuck in Melbourne while he spent months in Canberra. Last year would have been a tough year when it was through the eye of the storm. How did you manage that? Because he was away so often running the economy, trying to keep things afloat. Oh, look, I, I guess I'm used to Josh being away a lot and working long hours. So even when he's in Melbourne at home, he's often out before the kids wake up and gets home after they get to bed. So it wasn't hugely different to us in that respect. Obviously, the pressures were really high 
and there was a lot of stress as well and we had the same stresses as every family, particularly in Victoria. During that time away, the Treasurer's task was to keep the nation's economy afloat. There was a huge hole that was created in the economy last year. We had Treasury fearing that unemployment could reach as high as 15%. That's more than 2 million unemployed, that GDP could fall by more than 20%. Uh, these are unprecedented uh, numbers in Australia's recent economic history. And so that's why these extraordinary times called for extraordinary measures. And JobKeeper, the JobSeeker coronavirus supplement, the cash flow boost, the $750 payments to millions of pensioners, carers and others on income support were so important. The RBA credited those decisions with saving 700,000 jobs. But that benefit does come with a burden for future generations. The Treasurer turning to his former boss and mentor, John Howard, at the 11th hour early last year. I spoke to him on the eve of announcing the JobKeeper uh, payment with the Prime Minister and I was explaining to him it's an economy-wide wage subsidy, $1,500 a fortnight, not something that a traditional Liberal Treasurer would be announcing. And he said to me, he said, Josh, during times of national crises there are no ideological constraints. And for me that was very much a green light, that we were on the right path uh, and that what we were doing was so important. Given the opportunity uh, of uh, providing a buffer, uh, the government didn't cheese pear about it. They provided, I can remember talking to him at the time and said it's better uh, to err on the side of over provision than under provision at a time like this. And certainly that was done. On Tuesday night, Josh Frydenberg will outline Australia's next steps on the post-pandemic road to recovery. His third budget, so different from the first two. Since his October economic update, the economy's been bolstered by restriction relief and the resumption of domestic travel. But there's no doubt that COVID challenges and some of the costs remain. How would you characterise this budget ahead of you delivering it on Tuesday? Well, Kieran, this is another pandemic budget, but there is a road to recovery in Australia uh, is seeing um, some very positive signs with the economy, but we're not out of this crisis yet. You only have to see uh, terrible events around the world, including in India, uh, as well as uh, here. We've had state-wide lockdowns, for example, recently in Western Australia to remind us um, that the virus is still with us. It's very stubborn. It's still deadly. And uh, we have to be very vigilant. Do you recognise, you know, in terms of the vaccine rollout, just how central that is to the economic story right now? Because obviously you would, we see the health component being underpinning the, the strong economic recovery. If the vaccine rollout doesn't go smoothly from here, that threatens the, the budget and economic outlook, doesn't it? Well, Australia's success in terms of our economic recovery does largely depend on our ability to suppress the virus domestically. And that's why we've taken a very uh, strong approach with respect to international borders uh, and, of course, you know, setting up uh, the National Cabinet to work through issues like the logistics of the, the vaccine rollout. You will get there on the vaccine front? Of course we will. And we will continue to roll out the vaccine as quickly as possible. But at the same time, it's really important that state responses are proportionate to the risks that are, that are faced so that we can keep that momentum, that confidence in the recovery. Bearing in mind too, Kieran, that there's $240 billion on household and business balance sheets today that was not there this time last year. That's money that's either been saved or that the government has provided uh, with its um, significant support. We want that money to be spent obviously in accordance with uh, how businesses and households choose, but that money being spent across the economy will help keep that momentum going. Do you think, like Gladys Berejiklian has suggested, that Australians have to have a rethink about how we see COVID-19 once the rollout is done? Because at the moment we're so uh, committed to zero cases, but once everyone's vaccinated, or the vast bulk of the population, if we're ever going to reopen the, the border, surely there has to be a, a discussion about how we see COVID-19 and the fact that there might be a few cases here and there if people are allowed to, to visit this country. I have no doubt that um, the national, the international response to COVID will evolve as the vaccine is, is rolled out. And you're already starting to see that around the world. But at the same time, we've seen how damaging uh, a spread of cases 
uh, can be, even here in Australia, uh, with the lockdowns that we saw in Victoria that my family, like so many others, were, were subject to. And so we've got to be very careful to put Australia's, Australians' health first. But you think once we get to that vaccine point that there will be a, a reassessment? I, I do think that there will be a rethink across the world as to how to live and deal with the virus uh, as that vaccine is rolled out. This pandemic budget is also in part a pre-election budget. May 21st next year, the latest possible date for the poll. And with the looming showdown in mind comes a policy and rhetoric rethink. Long gone is the Liberals' push for cuts and constraints. The blueprint now is to repair the budget bottom line through a boost to spending and by reducing the jobless rate. The last time Australia had a, sust a sustained period of unemployment below 5% was between 2006 and 2008, just prior to the GFC. Before that, you need to go all the way back to the 1970s. History clearly weighs heavy on Josh Frydenberg's mind. Written on the walls within Canberra's Treasury building, where he and his team have relocated for the past month to bring the budget together, are the words of Australia's first Treasurer, George Turner. The Treasury was the smallest of the seven Commonwealth departments. Five men appointed in July, five men, was the whole of Treasury, and George Turner delivered the budget October 1901. Well, some things change and some things stay the same. Um, one thing that hasn't changed is that the, any surpluses the states want to get, I can see that. Um, <laughs> but I tell you, one thing that has changed for this year's budget is that revenue is greater than expenditure. The states wanting the, uh, the proceeds hasn't changed too much, has it? Well, many a Prime Minister have said never get between a Premier and a bucket of money. Um, and uh, I certainly count my fingers after I speak to the state treasurers, uh, but, uh, <laughs> because they've always got their hand out. From George Turner, the first Treasurer, to Josh Frydenberg, there have been only a handful that have faced the sort of global shock of a pandemic. 